Hi, you may remember a few months ago, I did a video about this distribution box, and I said I was going to build it into a 10 megahertz reference. Well, it's finally happened, and let me show you how it came out, and then I'll go into all the details. Open it like this, you can see all the cards inside. But one card looks a little different, and that's this one right here. Let's pull it out and take a look. So you can see right away, it's got the 10 megahertz double oven crystal oscillator right here. These are pretty cheap. They're on eBay. They're, they're uh, very affordable. Really hot, too. They run off 12 volts, and they give you a nice uh, sine wave on the output. On the back is where all the interesting stuff took place. Yeah. So here's what happened, and this is why it took so long to make this video. This card provides about 14 volts DC and you need 12 volts to run the crystal oscillator. And I thought, well, I'll just use one of those little three terminal uh, regulators to do this. But it turns out, even though the data sheet says it needs a two volt margin from input voltage to output voltage, it really needs more like about two and a half volts. So in order to produce 12 volts, you need about 14 and a half coming in. I didn't ha quite have 14 and a half from this circuit. I tried it anyway but it showed a lot of variation. If I made a small variation on the input power, uh, say, you know, 14.1 or, you know, 13.99 or whatever, you would see the same difference come out with the 12 volts. So the three terminal jobber just wasn't gonna do the trick. And so what I thought I'd do is just uh, build my own LDO since I don't have an LDO available. And here's the result of that. It was quite a project and I'll get into it in just a minute here. But suffice to say, uh, don't don't build an LDO unless you really have to. Just buy one. <laughs> uh, Performance-wise, this is working really well. Uh, the harmonics are more than 30 dB down, and it's able to drive uh, multiple pieces of equipment. Take a look here. Uh, most of this is being referenced from the 10 megahertz that's generated down below. Okay, let's take a look at how a regular voltage regulator works. This is your standard linear, not low dropout voltage regulator like a 7805 or a 7812. And the basic idea is the voltage comes in here, goes into a transistor, which is configured as an emitter follower. And the emitter output, which is the low impedance, high current output of the transistor, drives the load. The circuit, like this one, drives the base of the transistor such that the output, as sampled by the negative feedback terminal, reaches the voltage programmed by the voltage reference inside the device. In this case, I've drawn a Zener diode, but it may be something more sophisticated. Um, in many circuits, this is divided to ground, so it sees a fraction of the output and it basically has more gain. But this is the basic idea. The only limitation to this kind of regulator is that the amplifier here has to be driving at almost the voltage of the output. So if you want to make say 13.8 volts here, you need 0.6 above that right here. And for an op amp to make this voltage, the rail needs to be a little bit above that voltage, unless it's one of those magical devices that claims to be rail to rail. And by the way, they don't really exist, but you know, the op amp will be performing basically near its rails to do this. And this transistor here is not gonna turn on until this is 0.6-ish above that one and this is an additional about a 0.3 volt higher. So you end up needing about a volt across this device in order to possibly make this work. Now in practice, this amplifier here doesn't have a whole lot of current. And with the beta of a power amplifier being around 20 to 50, um, in order to drive you know, an amp or more, you really use a Darlington right here, which means you need double the voltage margin just to make this part work. If this is Darlington, and maybe this isn't exactly rail to rail, you end up needing, uh, you know, a volt or two to get this going, and sometimes even more. And as I found out from the 7812 data sheet, it needs two volts input to output of margin or more. However, when I tried it, I really didn't see good regulation until I got to two and a half volts. You can test this just by running 12, uh, let's say, uh, 14 volts into a 12 volt regulator and see what you get on the output, and then change the input by 10% and see if the output maintains uh, stability. If it does, you've got enough margin, and if it doesn't, then you don't. All right, so then given this circuit, and given that I couldn't do that in, in my project here, 
I didn't have enough margin on this circuit to use a standard three terminal regulator. Um, I had to use something called a low dropout regulator or an LDO. It's also a type of linear regulator, but let me show you the difference real quick. Okay, so on the top we have the traditional high dropout linear regulator and on the bottom we have an LDO, a low dropout regulator. Both regulators are types of linear regulators. Don't ever confuse that. They're both linear, okay? With the LDO down here, you'll notice the transistor terminals have been flipped around and it's the other type of transistor too. So we have the emitter as the input and then the output here is the collector. The main difference between these two is the impedance of this terminal. The impedance here is one over GM. That could be just like tens of ohms, okay? Maybe 10 ohms, maybe 20 ohms, something like that. And the impedance right here is RO, which could be 20,000 ohms or 50,000 ohms. It's something very high. Now under feedback, the intrinsic impedance is lower. That is true. However, as you'll see, the control loop for something like this, where you have a high impedance inside the control loop is much less stable. And that's why an LDO should not be used unless you actually need the lower dropout because what you introduce into the circuit is instability and you get oscillations on the output. The way you stop those oscillations is you put a dominant pole at your load, which is done by using a capacitor. And I'll get into more of that in just a minute. What you do see also is the air amplifier has the polarity flipped, just like the transistor. And the reason for that is when you drive the base, you get sort of an opposite effect in the collector. Whereas in this circuit, when you drive the base, you get the same effect at the emitter. Another thing you'll notice here is that the transistor is being kind of used like a current source with the collector being the output. And what we're doing is we're driving this exponential right here. Remember, the VBE of a transistor is going to um, be very sensitive compared to what we're doing here where the base is basically equal to the emitter. This is totally the other way around. And so we're determining this 0 0.5 to 0 0.7, 0 0.6-ish voltage right here. And that is causing current to come out of here and we're just regulating the results so that the voltage doesn't get out of hand and it equals this V ref in the way this is drawn right here. If you look at data sheets for LDOs, and I'll, I'll pull up a couple, um, you'll notice that they recommend certain ESR, certain equivalent series resistance capacitors. Very often they recommend tantalums. There's a couple on this board. And the basic idea is you need an ESR between some low and some high value. Not too much and not too little. And then you can create a dominant pole for the response of this amplifier and basically you won't get in a case where you have instability. And so you'll notice on my circuit here, there's my dominant pole. Can you see where it is? Yeah, it's right there. It took that electrolytic capacitor. I looked around, I tried some different values and that's what I ended up needing to do. I also had to add a capacitor here on the input side of my LDO because I noticed that it was not very stable coming from uh, here. The unregulated voltage had a lot of ripple in it, but uh, this definitely helped with that. Let me go in a little further and show you some more details about this circuit. So here is the circuit I ended up with um, missing some of the details, but we'll get into those in a minute. I used a MOSFET for this, and I really should have drawn it uh, over here. But anyway, and the MOSFET I used was one I got off one of my junk boards. I've got lots of boards of junk basically around here. And I pulled off a, uh, a random P-channel MOSFET. This particular MOSFET is an enhancement mode P-channel, and that means that the threshold voltage demands at the gate actually goes lower than, than the voltage input and hence much lower than the voltage output. And so what that does right away is it gives this a much greater range of control. The headroom requirements for this amplifier, um, it turns out in practice, this is about four volts here to make 12. So this really only needs like uh, five or six volts right here. So you easily have enough power and headroom in this circuit the way it's drawn. Another interesting thing about this circuit is I've bootstrapped it. So the reference, the VREF, is coming from over here. This is an LM336 voltage regulator, I mean a uh, voltage reference. I pulled it off an old television power supply board and I followed the data sheet to make it a, uh, well, that's what the data sheet said to do, so I did it. But what's cool about this is when you turn the circuit on, this is off, so it has no voltage reference. And the circuit doesn't really know what to do, but slowly it begins to power this 
And once it gets to about two volts, you get a, a reference voltage coming out of here that goes over to here. Doing it this way, the bootstrap method, instead of powering the circuit over here, gives you an even more stable output because as this stabilizes, it makes this more stable, which makes this more stable, which makes this more stable, etc. And so you end up with a really stable voltage output here by referencing it back to itself at the input. For the op amp here, I chose to build my own, and that may have been a bit of a mistake. It was really, really difficult. Um, so this is how I ended up, but let me show you kind of uh, where it came from. Yeah, there was a, a lot of fun being had in the garage doing this, and I wouldn't say this is a great idea, but on the other hand, never miss an opportunity, right? And so I had a lot of fun building the circuit, and uh, let me just walk you through a little bit how the circuit works, because I think it's uh, a really neat. Okay, so here is the circuit I used as an amplifier in my LDO. This is the inverting input and the non-inverting input, and this is the output. V plus is the supply voltage, which in this case was uh, 14 volts. This is ground and ground. All right, now let me explain how it works a little bit. So, first of all, we have a differential pair right here. I didn't use fancy transistors, they were just uh, two in quad twos I had. And there's a resistor here to bias them, not a current source or anything fancy like that. But all you need to know is uh, there's a little voltage right here, created by one of these inputs, there's a little bit of current that happens. Isn't that right? We can calculate the bias current through this resistor really easily. Normally this would be kind of an annoying exercise, but in this case it's really simple because uh, you already know this voltage right here, right? In my case it was uh, two and a half volts. That's the reference voltage I use in my circuit. We can take two and a half volts, 0.6, 1.5K, and we can arrive at the bias current, which is around a milliamp or so. Don't make me do the math. You can figure it out yourself. Okay. Now, you have these two transistors amplifying, and they're in a differential pair, which means drawing current from this one causes an opposite effect in this transistor here, because they share this current source here. Up here, something really interesting happens. This is a current mirror, and what that means is the VBE of a transistor determines its collector current, right? And so right here, we have the base and the emitter, and in this transistor, we've tied the base to the collector. It's in diode mode, we call this, okay? And in a current mirror, the transistor can in diode mode is sort of the dominant one of the pair. And so the current that comes through this collector here, of this transistor, determines the VBE of this one. And if you notice, this transistor here has the same VBE as this one. There's no difference. The base is connected to the base. The emitter is connected to the emitter. So it should have approximately the same current right here. And so the way this works, the current from this side ends up being mirrored over here. And the current from this transistor also comes out over here. So you end up with current from both sides going through over here. It goes over here to this. Now this is my output stage. It's just an emitter follower. It's purely class B and audio files, you, you can relax. This is not an audio amplifier. So there's no bias in here. Um, the amplifier biases the output transistors, and that's fine. Crossover distortion is not a problem here. I used two transistors. Only one is really needed, um, but I felt maybe the transient response would be better if I could pull current hard in either direction, so that's why there's two over here. And, of course, this is the voltage that ends up driving the MOSFET. Here is the complete LDO schematic. I've posted all the files to my GitLab which I will link to in the description. Was it worth the uh, the dive into uh, building your own LDO and learning about oftenized references? I, I would say so. It's been really fun. I've, I've got to learn a lot of different things and I'll put it all to use in uh, different ways over the years, I'm sure. So until next time, thank you for watching.